everyone. Welcome back to the Cambridge Union. Um, today we will be hosting a panel event on police, civil liberties, and feminism. We are joined here by Ngozi Fulani and Jan Headley, and we are joined on Zoom by Bel Bero Adi and Shami Chakrabarti. Today we're going to discuss, do the police help or harm feminist movements? Can the police or the political be a site of feminist organizing? And the breaking up the vigil of Sarah Everard's death demonstrate Fisher's and important questions in the relationship of feminism, civil liberties, the state, and the police. Um, before we start, I just want to discuss some things about the format of the event. Um, we can, we'll start with opening remarks for each panelist just to explain who they are, what they do, and their relationship to this question. Then we'll go through some <laughs> questions by me, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor and questions from the live stream. And just a reminder to keep your mask on when asking a question. Thank you guys so much. I guess I'll pass it on to either of you for opening remarks, just explaining who you are, what you do. And your All right, so greetings, questions. everybody, and greetings to the panel. Um, thank you for taking the time out. My name's Ngozi Fulani, and I am the CEO of Sister Space, which is a charity for African and Caribbean heritage women and girls affected by domestic and sexual abuse. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janami, or Jan Headley. Um, I also work for the Sister Space. I'm a senior IDVA and the operations manager. Just, just so you're clear, an IDVA is an independent domestic violence advisor, and I am also an IDVA and an ISVA, independent sexual violence advisor. Belle, you go. Um, Belle, you go. <laughs> Thank you, Shami. Uh, my name is Belle Ribeira Adi. I'm the Member of Parliament for Streatham. Um, I, I was Sarah Everard's uh, constituency Member of Parliament, um, and I also led a reasoned amendment against the Policing, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill to see it thrown out. Um, hi there. My name is Shami Chakrabarti, and I'm absolutely delighted to be on, on this panel with um, these wonderful women who are doing such important work. Really delighted that the, that the unions decided to showcase the work of Sister Space this evening. Um, um, I'm a human rights uh, lawyer and activist and Labour peer. Um, I was um, um, Shadow Attorney General until just over a year ago. And before that, I was the director of the human rights organisation, Liberty. Um, and uh, Bell is at, at the legitimate elected end of the um, end of Parliament. I'm at the appointed end of, of Parliament, and um, and there, you know, we, we work together to um, to try and make some inroads into some pretty shocking legislation, whether it's spy cops or whether it's the new police bill. But perhaps we'll touch on some of these things as we go on this evening. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, if we could just start with opening remarks from each of our panelists um, for a quick minute, that would be great. Sorry, would you open your remarks? I don't even know where to start. I'm going to, I think I just better give a little bit of a warning that I'm, I'm coming with truth today. And it may be um, a little bit hard to swallow. But I don't see the point in being here if we cannot bring positive changes. So you'll actually hear my accent change slightly as well as I, you know, as I go deep. And today is going to be a day that we're, we're going to, to learn something. Everybody in here is going to learn something today. So I would follow up with that by saying we're very honoured to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting us and to be amongst the lovely ladies that are here with us today. Um, it's a big honor, it's a really, really nice thing to see and I think it's a great step in the direction of change. Um, I want to say Sarah's very tragic death has opened up a, a wider conversation um, right across the country, um, I, I think, and, and potentially across the world in terms of what's happening with regards to violence against women and girls. I think it's definitely shone a light on where we have so many in, in, inadequacies in terms of our legislation, in terms of our policing, in terms of the resources put towards violence um, against women, women and girls more generally. And I think it's really important that we look at a, an entire culture change in society, not just the type of sticking plasters that often come 
at a time um, when, when an incident has happened and people attempt to, as, as politicians often, often do, uh, to look like something is happening as opposed to making sure that something does happen. Well, I absolutely agree with, with what we've heard so far. Um, I think um, we've, got to, we've got to work very, very hard to make sure that we honour Sarah Everard's memory and honour the memories of so many women mm. of all colours and all places um, to make sure that this isn't, that isn't a moment, <laughs> but this is actually a movement for major, major dramatic change in our world. I've, and I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Of Women in the 21st Century, and I asked people to imagine uh, what a Martian, uh, a, a sexless Martian, uh, or a hermaphrodite or sexless Martian would think if they landed on our planet anywhere in the world, what would they think of this strange apartheid that exists between men and women and the consequences of that and, and which oppression or injustice or persecution would they notice everywhere? And I don't use words like apartheid like, lightly, you know, um, I, I use my words very carefully, but what I'm talking about is structural discrimination and oppression. And, but not just in one country for one period in time, this, this issue is global and it's millennial, but, but, uh, but, uh, but it's also intersectional. So when we're, you know, when we're, and why it's so important to listen to the sisters from Sister Space is that there we're talking um, about structural misogyny and structural racism that are inter that are intertwined and the women who are the bottom of the heap. And you add to that 11 years of austerity in the criminal justice system. And what you're looking at is women who are not being heard when they are going to the police station with complaints of violence and sex offences. And you're also looking at system that is... Um, but is not equipped uh, in terms of its training and in terms of its resources to deliver for these women. And you're looking at statistics that, that effectively decriminalise offences like rape in England and Wales nearly a quarter of the way into the 21st century. So there is so much to do, but it is not, um, as Belle said, a moment for sticking plasters. It's a moment for very dramatic structural and radical change. And I think that it's very important that we listen now, um, you know, at, at perhaps at a bit more length to, to the people at the sharp end. And that's really Ngozi and Genobi from Sister Space. Thank you so much. Can I just get something? There's something weighing heavy on my chest. I have to get it off. Now, when we heard about Sarah Everard's disappearance, as a mother, a grandmother, as a human being, as a woman. I was also glued to the TV, hoping that she'd be found. When she was found and, and it transpired what happened to her, I felt the pain just like any human being. So they had vigils. I went to the vigil with members of Sister Space, including Janami. And what we saw there opened our eyes to this. You see, Sarah is not the only victim of abuse who lost her life. But she's the only one that keeps getting mentioned. You see? So when I heard of her murder, I didn't say, oh, I wonder what color she is. Or no. I said, a, a, a sister, a woman, is in trouble, let us all stand together. But we're not standing together. And I'm not driving, I don't know how many miles I drove, to stand here to perform in front of you. You're going to get the truth today. There is racism, even in the violence against women sec and girls sector. You see? Because look what happened to, to Biba and Nicole. And there are cases in the Old Bailey right now. People don't know that. Police thought it was appropriate to take selfies of their bodies. Where was the outrage? So how, what I want to know and what I don't understand, and I, I guess I just need to get it off my chest, is what is different about Sarah that is not different about Nicole, Biba, and countless other black women who have died before and after 
Why are we not hearing their names? Is it time for us to examine ourselves and the bias within? I got it. It's off. I did say. I did. I, I did say. I don't come to play. <laughs> no, a hundred percent. I think I might amend the running order of some of my questions. And right after that, um, I want to ask about the whitewashing of the feminist movement. A lot of the times we see um, just the same symbols, um, white innocence. And I mean, I think it's very conspicuously clear as a panel of four women of color, um, how can we address the whitewashing of the feminist movement? Can it be addressed? And what can be done? This is on, it's on, right. Um, when you ask the question, what can be done? Um, if I'm being honest, I don't look at the situation as a what can be done. I just don't align myself with it. Though I share values with the feminism culture, I would not call myself a feminist because it doesn't serve me and it doesn't serve my community. I'm a human, I'm a black woman, and I don't get to be discriminated against for being a woman because before I can even get there, I'm discriminated against for being black. And that's not just by men, that's by women too. That's from people of all different backgrounds. But I think to play around with the idea that feminism is a bunch of women that stand united and have each other's back is to lie to ourselves, basically. And I do think that most of it is geared towards the benefit of the white woman and it's in usage of every other woman. And I speak on behalf of the black women, so that's who I will refer to. Um, yeah, I think feminism has been used historically to use the black women in support of getting whatever it is the white woman's agenda is at the time, whether it's the right to vote, whether it's uh, to push toxic masculinity, kill the bill, whatever it is, it's not that their agenda is wrong. I just feel like you can't come to those you have oppressed and ask to hold their hands as you are continuing to oppress them, if that makes sense. So in terms of what can be done, I feel like there's a lot of steps before we even get, get there. So, just to tack on to that, this linking arms and singing Kumbaya, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> we're at two different places. You're over there, and we're quay back there. You see? And you also have to think about our history in this country, whether we were born here or not. Toxic. You also have to think about when it comes to the whiteness. Because, you see, I don't really understand the English language. Even though I was born here and I know no other language, I don't understand it. Feminism and whiteness. This name-calling thing, BAME, Afro-Caribbean, all of this stuff, I don't understand it. And I refuse to engage with it. Okay? So, I understand when we say, in order to stand with us, you first have to see us. And then you have to hear us. And then we can talk about unity, because I think that's what they're alluding to. I'm not sure. Well, that was so powerfully put, wasn't it? And, and I, you know, I, how, how can you disagree? Because, that, you know, that's all facts-based, you know, evidence-based advocacy from both Ngozi and, and, and Janome. And in a sense, I don't even care about the, um, the words and the abstract um, debates about who is a feminist and this kind of feminist and that kind of feminist. What we want is outcomes and we need dramatic, we need dramatic change. And I, I, have, to, I have to agree. So to, 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 to draw on what uh, Janome said about the history of, of what, we, what, if you go back to say what they call first wave feminism. So now we're talking about floppy hats and suffragettes and the vote and all of that. There was, you know, if you like, the first family of English feminism was the Pankhursts, and there was a split. And there was a split in that family. There's a brilliant book, a, a recent biography of Sylvia Pankhurst that, that tells the story of that split, that schism in that family. And what was it about? It was about, are you going to be a bourgeois white feminist who wants to have the vote before her butler has the vote? And, and, and that sort of Christabel 
Pankhurst and to some extent Emmeline Pankhurst or are you Sylvia and you're also connected with liberation struggles around the world with the plight of working women um, and, and, and you see equality as an integrated thing and everybody matters and you know and that was the split and it was also over the first world war and frankly um, Christabel and Emmeline went with the imperial the British imperial priorities and and um sylvia went with what i would call human rights priorities which i think janome put very well and that schism that happened you know at the turn of the of the you know 19th century is something that we that we still have now and if we are literally arguing if we have to argue with pretty patel about people showing respect by taking the knee at football matches and that's a brown woman, right? That's a daughter of Asian migrants like me. And she's saying that it's gesture politics to show respect for, for victims of structural anti-black racism. We've got a problem and we're not singing Kumbaya. Um, so I have to just agree with what has been said. And in terms of what can be done, well, we, we do it. And what, one of the great things about Sister Space is it's not a talking shop, right? It's not a think tank. It's not even a, it, 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 yes, they, you can hear the great advocacy from the two sisters, but they are actually delivering services to women who are not otherwise getting them because the state, which should be embracing them and the community that should be looking after them is not, and they are actually doing that work. And so I think it's really important that in an elite institution like the University of Cambridge and the Cambridge Union, we are hearing that direct lived and worked experience from Sister Space. Thank you. I completely agree with the what's what's been said. Um, however, I do describe myself as a feminist and I would just explain why. Um, so absolutely right um, in, in terms of what's happened historically. But if if feminism is meant to be this truly global movement that is meant to be about all women then if it doesn't tackle racism as its as its core as one of its core issues um then then it's not relevant at all and actually the people who claim to call themselves feminists who who don't subscribe to that idea who don't realize that actually the majority of the women that live in this world that require that liberation are not actually white then they're the ones that aren't the feminists for a long time there are a lot of of women activists I know that would call, refer to themselves as womanists, uh, black women as womanists, because they couldn't they couldn't feel, see themselves fitting into the feminist movement. And I think uh, I think a time has come. And yes, it's, uh, Shami's absolutely right. We shouldn't be focused on the labels. We should be more focused on the outcomes. But in terms of what people want to call themselves, those that don't understand that intersec intersectionality, those that don't understand how important it is. Um, to be truly inclusive in that way, they they aren't the feminists. I'm not I'm not sure what they are. I think that's My right. Is... I think that's right, Belle. I think that's right, Belle. I I I, I do call myself a, a feminist too, but I cannot. In the end, I am about human rights, and and also I would I would be in the Sylvia Pankhurst camp and not in the Christabel Pankhurst. You know, I would be a socialist feminist, not yeah, what I would call absolutely. a sort of bo a bourgeois, bourgeoisie feminist, feminist yeah. yeah but in terms of actual outcomes i always say to people you know i've been to these to these posh panels including in the city of london where 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 very privileged women um most of them white not all of them white talk about how we need more women in the boardroom there's a big thing the boardroom the boardroom and that's fine and i'm saying fine of course you want women prime ministers and women in the boardroom and women in the high court. I support all of that, but it's not just about these top tables of power. It's about reimagining power and the distribution of power and thinking, yes, about the women sitting, who's sitting at the top table, but also who's serving at that table, who's cleaning that table, who's built that table, who's scrubbing the floors, who's looking after your children when uh, and, and, and when you come, you know, and that's what, and surely the pandemic Absolutely. is a moment for that kind of reimagining because we should be coming out of this pandemic into a 1945 type moment 
with liberation globally and redistribution domestically and globally. That's the kind of radicalism that we need to be imagining now as women, as black and brown women, frankly, as human beings. Um, that's, I don't, that's I don't even... I don't really want to get too wrapped up in the name. I've just said I don't understand a lot of the labels. Look, I, I was born in 1960-something, yeah? Leave me alone. I'm 30, yeah? And <laughs> when I, as, as I've been coming up, these different names that have come up, I don't subscribe to. But what I don't do is tell other people yeah. what they should call themselves mm -hmm. or not. That's cool. I, you know, more power to you. The reason why I steer away from the word feminism because it conjures up something for me that I don't recognize. But also, George Floyd is my brother. Not literally. Yeah. But he's my brother. While black yeah. men are dying, <laughs> yes, I, I don't have the... Is privilege the right word? I can't distance myself too far from my brother. I don't have that... Yes, privilege. That maybe my white counterparts might have because... Do white men don't really have that going on for them like the black man? So I have to walk a different road. I can't walk, I can't, there's a problem in my community, yes? There are perpetrators that are black men, yes. But the women are thinking, if we report him to the police, is he going to die or is he going to get three times longer than somebody else? So we have other things to consider. We don't have the privilege to sit down and say, what should I call myself? Oh, all this kind of thing. Mm -mm, we're too busy trying to live and make sure that our family live. You see? Just to, sorry, just to add to that statement, um, I would just like to highlight that um, there are three black women in this panel and we all have different views. And often when a black woman speaks, again, I'll speak on behalf of the black woman because that's where I have experience. Often when a black person speaks, it's taken as representation of what the whole community yeah. feel we're removed of the again privilege to have an independent thought or express yeah. an opinion and not be held accountable and have the weight of the whole community on our shoulders here we have two different narratives or i'd say a similar narrative that are arrive at different conclusion. I don't want to be referred to as a feminist. Others do. And I fully understand and respect the journey. I really acknowledge some of the things you've said in terms of a womanist. I'm just a black woman at the end of the day. That's me. That's me. I'm just a black woman. But I fully respect and understand the journey. And I think it's just important to highlight here that what you hear is a reflection of us as individual women. And we're referring to people in our culture and our demographic, but you may come across somebody else that looks like me, that sounds like me, that has a different experience. That doesn't mean that it's automatically void and it's, oh, I have to study black women today. And, but this black woman told me something yesterday, which we hear a lot of. Um, yeah, so just to highlight that, like, um, there, are, there are varied opinions, varied experiences, and they're all valid. For sure. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that you were saying, Gothi, about um, the dichotomy between speaking about trying to f recognize perpetrators as well as not going to the police. Could you speak a little bit more about the inadequacy of the police in dealing with these sorts of situations? Yes, how long have you got? Listen, <laughs> let me take you on a little journey a little bit back, yeah? When, and I didn't read this in a book, I lived it, okay? When I was going to school, the, the beating of black men and women kept, came like a national sport in the police force. I'm talking about experience, yes? I, my brothers, schoolmates, all of them have got marks or something from getting pulled up in a police van and getting a good beating. That's in the 60s and the 70s, all right? Decades later, they brought in race relations, this, that, and the other. So it's more underground, yes? Our experience with the police has been and continues to be a nightmare. There isn't many of us who, when we drive past them or walk past the police, something in our psyche makes us alert. It's not every now and again, we live, can I say flipping? We flipping live this day in and day out. 
I'm a mother of four and a grandmother of three. And it may surprise you that my daughter decided to come into uh, DV as well. She decided to train as an independent domestic violence because I was doing it on my own when I first started the Sister Space. Let me go back a little bit. Sister Space started after the death of Valerie Ford and her 23-month-old baby. Valerie, a locks woman, went to the police and told them that her ex-partner threatened to burn down the house with her and the children in it. It was put down as a threat to property. Do you know we were seen as property? Historically. All right? Consequently, machete, screwdriver, hammer, took them both out. I was running the sister space on my own. No funding, nothing for about four years. And then my daughter decided to train as a domestic um, advisor. And now she's full-time because it was just me. Because black organizations and black charities don't get funded. We're not taken seriously. We speak differently. We dress differently. And so we can't be professional, right? So now there's not two of us. There's about 15 of us at Sister Space now. And that's because of the community. The council didn't fund us. Well, they do now. The London Mayor's Office pays for one worker to support pan-London, black women, pan-London, one worker. It is the community that keeps us going. You see, now I have to give you that so that you understand where we stay with the police. We're still asked. So a big, strong woman like you, why didn't you fight back? Where's the red marks if he hit you? We still get that day in, day out. 98% of our service users who've reported rapes still have had no outcome. Most of the cases have been shut. This is today. Do we trust the police? No. Nope. Do we refer service users to the police? Yes. Is it a conflict? Hell yes. Do we know what to do? Mm -mm. But if we know someone's in danger, we have to say to them, call 999, because we can't get to everybody. But let me make it clear. We're under no illusion. We don't, our, our experience, we didn't read it in a book, our experience, and they come to the sister's place now, and we've met some very nice police officers, individuals, but as a whole, would we trust them? Let's have a round of Would I trust them? No. No. I would just like to um, add to your point about we have clients asking, um, telling our story, sorry, of police asking them for their bruises. Where are your bruises? Which is not proper training at all. Um, for those of you who don't know, there's a very wide spectrum of skin tones and complexions within the black community. We do not all bruise the same. And... That reference is just an example of the pinnacle always being the white standard, white standard as the norm. For the white skin complexion or the common white skin complexion to be the barometer of proving whether or not you've endured abuse, if you take a second to think of somebody, to think of what somebody's going through had they been abused, to take that courage to go to the police and report it, to be shut down by something like that, it's... Endless. It's not always physical as well. So the, mm -hmm. domestic abuse is not always physical. It's not always somebody being hit. There's so many different... But that's what we get all the time. So to answer your question, um, I would say personally, when I'm talking to clients, like you said, we have a duty of care. If they're in immediate danger, we have to tell you to report it to the police. If there's a crime that's been committed with consent, we have to report it to the police. Um, but I would honestly say... Um, it's not what I want to do. The soul, whatever you want to refer it to, is clanging when it happens. Yeah. I would say that the historic abuse and distrust within the black community and the police is a stranger to none. We know that in advising our clients to perhaps report the father of their children, an ex-husband, a family member, could lead to another George Floyd. We could be playing a part in potentially 
yeah. police brutality, police murder, police killings. And these are the things that we have to think of as an agency, as well as systematic racism, overt racism. We go into police stations with clients and let um, me experience ready. racism ourselves. Me, can I just give them an example? I've gone into Buffalo Green Police Station with a client who's tried to report three times. Now, I've walked in there looking like I do. Of course. He says, which one of you is the victim and which one of you is, is some? This is how he's talking. You, in there. You, sit. This is how. Absolutely. Right? And, and this person is, is from the quote-unquote BAME community. I hate that term. BAME community. Yeah. So one of the things that needs to stop happening is don't think that everybody who's non-white identifies the same. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes, right? So if you're not middle-class white, it seems like you can fit into the BAME category. If you're not a white male, if you're not a white British male. And, and woman to a point, yeah? But basically... Just to, to, so, sorry, just to agree mm. with you, Ngozi, um, um, Belle will tell it better than me, but the two of us, Belle and me, we went into um, Yarlswood Detention Centre you know, the immigration detention centre with, with our friend and colleague, Diane Abbott. And you, sh and, and we, and the racism that I experienced with those two there and Diane Abbott is a very famously a member of parliament and has been for over 30 years. And the racism that I watched between the, um, the, the, you know, the staff of, of, of these private contractors towards Diane Abbott Right, that's what happened just a few years ago, and that's this one of the most famous out. black women in the. That's one of the most famous black women in the country and a member of parliament. I know her and very what I well. Witness, mm -hmm. Right, so if that's mm -hmm. what she's getting when she walks in as the shadow home secretary, right. shadow home secretary at the time, right? If that's and by the way, we couldn't even get that visit without threatening litigation. So if that's right. what she's experiencing, right? How is it going to? How is it? What are you going to experience when you go in with your vulnerable clients to, to um, to the police station? Which is why Thank I thank you for that. Well, that's just my truth. You know, that's my small contribution yeah. to this truth-telling conversation because I think that's the that's the benefit of an evening like this. This isn't a debate. This isn't for the motion and against the motion. This is trying to um, explain to people what is happening even now, even even today, and of course. So that's the an example. Yeah. That's an example. Why isn't, I mean, I know Diane very, very well. I've known her for over 30 years. I'm a, yeah. I'm a drummer. I used to teach her son African drumming. I know her. The amount of abuse that woman receives is off the chain. Yeah. Where is the outrage? Yeah. Why is it, it's, and like I said, my heart belongs to Sarah. Yes. But my heart belongs to every woman. We now have to examine ourselves. I'm under no illusion. I'm under no illusion. So I could sit in this very nice Cambridge University. And it's very nice. But I'm under no illusion. Yes? White women are considered more softer, more in need of help, more, I don't know, what than black women. So... A white woman could never have to experience the amount of abuse Diane is getting. What are you doing? Hmm? So I ask every single person who will see this, what part are you playing? You, we could blame the police, could blame everybody. But we have to look at self. What is that? I came out for Sarah and I came out for this, but I came out for that. Can't come out for everybody, but it's not based on color. Okay, so we ask ourselves, before I keep quiet, let's talk about Valerie's Law, please. Yeah, Valerie's Law, because that's the thing that has to come out today. There has to be a change. So Valerie's Law t-shirt, I got the t-shirt in purple, but it didn't match what I was wearing, so I refused to wear it. Okay, so Valerie's Law is the petition that Sister Space has, which seeks to make it mandatory that anybody who's dealing with domestic abuse sexual abuse or any violence against women have basic training about African heritage women and girls. And I'll tell you why, okay? 
Do you see my hair? Does anybody in the room have hair like mine? So let me ask you a question. If you were going to work at 9 o'clock and it's 8.30, could you take a chance, wash your hair, blow dry and go? Is, is it, most of the people are saying yes. Me, if I wash my hair, you're not going to see me at work for three days. Yeah? My hair is different. It's locked, it's thick. If I saturate my hair, my head can't hold up. My skin, there's, there, what I'm saying is, I have different needs as a black woman. Mm. Why are we ignoring these things? So people say, but why do you need a special uh, charity for, for black women? Do you ask the dis disabled people why they need... The, do you ask the oh. LG, Do you ask other people? That's no, but right. we keep getting asked that. Right? So, sign Valerie's law. I'm sure that the university will make that petition available. Absolutely. But you are university people. I'm sure you can go online and look at Valerie's law. Sign but it also, and share invoke, it. Or follow us on Twitter. In, sorry to interrupt, but also, I would, I had, I've been looking at your website and I would ask people to have a look at the fundraising needs on the Sister Space website because you make a very clear case on there. For example, you are, I believe, fundraising for a vehicle because you sometimes yes. get calls in the middle of the night or whatever and there's nobody to go and literally rescue a sister um, and so you want a vehicle. You need funds so that you can train more people. You need funds yes, so that you can do more. So these are all things that you know, these are all campaigns that we can get behind and that Cambridge students and members of the Cambridge Union can get behind so that, yes, we do the debating and the activism, mm. but we're linking it to the to making things actually happen and to the grassroots and service delivery. There That's it is. The can you come and work things. for us? We can't pay you. you we can't okay. pay you, but we'd like you to work for us. <laughs> Thank you. So you can find that Lots information at... Um, I think Sorry, info at sisterspace.org for any information, just email us or check us on Instagram or Twitter at sisterspace. Um, my next question really is going off of what you just said, Ngozi, about examining our own biases. What do you think we can do as students besides going to direct action and speaking to our friends, sort of to look at ourselves and then, but also not get caught into a trap where we're just constantly centering ourselves in these conversations what can we do directly as students let me set them a challenge go to your lecturer your manager your boss tell them to take the sister space training ask them because we think a half a day or a full day's training at cambridge university because if you think that in 10 minutes you've learned something try a day with us right so it's about examining yourselves how many of you was at the the black lives matter rally and you walked for miles and everything a year later where are we where are we hmm? the pretty colored placards that came out very nice what are you actually doing talk is good action is better I think I would agree. I would say that um, the fact that you're all here is obviously a, a great start. There is interest there. Um, I would more align myself with this generation and I do think that we're heading in a better direction. I think with time does come change. Um, I don't think it's fast enough. I don't think the change is great enough. I think it is while it's trending or while it serves certain communities. I appreciate the efforts but I also understand the pattern of other cultures, listening to a seminar or putting up a black square on Instagram or going to a march and then feeling good about themselves, they've done their bit. And although you've done something, it's great, what is that something doing? It may seem like this race conversation is always on the table, but when it's life and death, or when it's your mum or your dad or your brother or your sister, or your boyfriend, or your partner, or your girlfriend, whatever, it really is everything. Race is in everything. I never understood the argument of the black card or the race card or anything like that. When you understand oppression or who feels it knows it is the expression, it is in everything. And I think you really have to challenge yourself and ask, do you have any black colleagues? 
Who are your superiors? Do any of them look different to you? Do they all look alike you? Are your classmates all the same? Why are opportunities presented in certain areas and not in others? Do you live in a really nice building on a really nice road and you look Have across you the road? Garden? And you look across the road and you see somewhere like Grenfell. It's okay to be here having the discussions, but what are you actually doing? And I think having these awkward conversations, having these difficult conversations, sometimes internally acknowledging where there are issues in the household, where there are biases or where there are practices that you've been taught and things that you have to unlearn. Because me as a black woman, I've had to unlearn so much, so, so much. It's not about pointing fingers. It's about identifying the problems finding a solution and getting on with it. At the end of the day, we don't have the time. I definitely don't have the time to sit and talk and hold hands and don't feel sorry for me, just do something about it. Because I don't need pity, I need action. I need my boyfriend and my brother to be able to go to the shop and grab what I need and come back home safely. That's what we need. So I would say, keep the work up, but be about it. Do you know what I mean? Do as well as you are speaking. Homework, homework. Look at the amount of black women that have been murdered in the last year. Do you know their names? If not, why not? I would say a great example is obviously what you're doing, using the platform you have or using the word privilege that you have for better. Um, we're all born in the situations that we're born in. Maybe you can't do anything about what you've been born into, but you can make change with what you've got. So use the things around you, use the resources around you and also listen. Um, it's one thing to hear people, it's another thing to listen and understand that there are things... Say that again, please. I think No, I really think you should say that again. It's one thing to hear people, but it's another thing to listen. I think to understand that there will be things that you will never understand is very important too. It's hugely important. If there's anything that I can stress to you, it's probably that there are unknown unknowns. So you may not be aware of something that you're doing, but once you have been made aware of it, take the time to check yourself and take the time to check your friend. Because if you see it and you do nothing about it, you're part of the problem. See, you know, I told you I was going to go into a dialect. See me, you know, big up yourself. I don't think you guys understood any of that. <laughs> yes, man. Um, we, we have an English language that's an English language. So even with, amongst ourselves, sometimes we have to go into small dialect. There are people who are in your class that look like me. There are staff members that look like me. There's people that work around the building that look like me. If you really look at them and if you really talk to them, are they okay? Are they really okay? I think I wanted to pose to you, Bell and Chami, sort of the question that Jan was talking about, about, um, Bell, you've spoken about, I'm here for your right to protest. I think I wanted to ask, what do you think Labour is doing and could be doing to better support protesters and demands such as Valerie's Law? Uh, you're asking about the Labour Party specifically? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm asking okay, about the Labour well, Party specifically and then <laughs> Parliament. I, mean, I, I only ask because it's the current government that's attempting to quash our right to protest, whereas the Labour Party voted against the piece of legislation that was put, put down. So in terms of what we're doing specifically, that, that I think will be the first thing, making sure that we are actually standing up for people's right to protest. I think what happened... Um, at, at, at Clapham Common, I mean, Ngozi was talking about going to the particular vigil in my constituency. It was just so ironic that um, the police were breaking up an event that was about women's safety by using um, means which looked violent. That was absolutely Vi it was uh, violent. I saw it. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know, since then they they I think as far as I'm concerned, marked their own homework and said that everything was okay. But reports. Uh, from there and, and, and obviously myself going to speak to the officers finding out what was happening looked like looked like exactly as it did um, on, on when, what everybody saw in terms of uh, the news reports that came out and I think when we think about looking at issues of of women's safety actually women's right to to make that noise about their their safety we need to be very careful uh, with just looking at legislation as a means of, of achieving this uh, we know that the police and crime sensing courts bill is going forward and obviously that stops uh that stopping protests and you know with with that particular piece of legislation uh you would be given more time 
um, on, on average for knocking over a statue or defacing a statue of, of a white slave owner than you would uh, for, for violating a woman, which is absolute, an absolute disgrace. But even if we immediately put in pieces of legislation that would, that would make things better in terms of sentencing for, for violence against women, it's not going to make a difference at the moment because we see that men um, rarely find themselves in court. And what happened after um, Sarah's, Sarah's disappearance is actually a lot more women in the local area came forward uh, to, to talk about incidents that had happened to them and didn't necessarily, they didn't necessarily report in the past. And, you, you know, you, you've heard about the, a lot of the issues that people have with the police. Um, it, women overall have issues when, when going to the police. But, you know, and Gozi's touched on it as well, how, how difficult it is for, for black women to go to, to the police. And, and part of a lot of the protests we have, many of the protests that I've been been on, is, is, is protesting against discriminatory stop and search, protesting um, for many, many different things um, against, against immigration detention centres, all of these things that affect our liberation, our civil liberties as, as, as black people that essentially will be taken away by this piece of legislation. So, you know, all, all of those things are, are part and parcel. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud that the Labour Party voted against uh, the legislation as it's going through. They're attempting to, to amend it, but it's all part and parcel, as Shami had touched on earlier, this whole kind of suite of, 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 of really, really draconian legis pieces of legislation that really points towards the type of society uh, we're moving towards. Really, really dangerous stuff. Can I just, just sorry, confirm just to, just to you something? To, to, my, my, so, myself, sorry, sorry myself and Janami were at that vigil. We saw the police group in groups of about 10 or 12, firm up, go right into the crowd, drag out a single woman and bring her out. And that sometimes they were, they were doing those art, military so them army songs, like they would... It was horrible. We didn't read it. We didn't look it on the news. We were there. It happened at least 10 times. We videoed it. So let, we, let us just confirm for anybody who's under any doubt. At a vigil for a woman who was murdered by the police, the police could not have been more violent. It was terrible. Um, well, it's good to hear that from an eyewitness, but, and, and, and that does seem to be what eyewitnesses are saying. And I read mm. stories of women who were catcalled or harassed on their way home from the demonstration who tried to complain to the police, but then were told it basically it serves you right for going on that demonstration. And to be clear about this legislation that Bell is talking about, it is a direct response to what? To Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. So it's a deliberate, they call it a culture war. And this is the government responding to Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion, which who reflect two of the most important burning issues facing the world today. One, st deep, deep millennial structural injustice and the other climate catastrophe. And people demonstrate because when people have no voice, what are they going to do? They're going to come together and they're going to demonstrate on the streets. And the government it suddenly doesn't like protest anymore. But excuse me, when um, people were protesting in favour of Brexit outside the Supreme Court, it's, then the government had no problem with street protest. When it's people with short haircuts defending statues, then there's no problem with protest. The problem with protest is when it's Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion. So the government is playing a very dangerous game. This, this particular conservative government is playing a very, very a dangerous game with the politics of race on the one hand and of protest on the other, and it's divide and conquer. And we have to respond. Um, I think we have to respond uh, with unity, yes, unity, and I know unity is difficult, and we're not singing Kumbaya, but frankly, Ngozi has demonstrated her unity not by singing Kumbaya, by on the one hand telling difficult truths to people, but equally going on the mass vigil, and but and crucially, you know, serving the community who needs to be served and is otherwise being let down. Awesome. I think we're part of the time where. 
I'll open it up to questions from the audience. So if you just have a question, if you just raise your hand and wait till one of our stewards can get to you. I hope we haven't frightened you off. That was not our intention. Just feel free to ask anything. It's a safe space. Do I just speak? Sorry, yeah. Keep your mask on when you ask a question. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. No. Um. Uh. I don't. I wouldn't say it's really a question, but I just want to say that I resonated with everything you were saying, and it was like really powerful. And um, like, yeah. Uh, as it's just uh, the the one of the very first things that was said about a Martian coming to this planet and just going. Uh, or the flip, I think I can say flip, uh, is going on here. There is just so many forms of oppression and stuff that go on. Uh, so uh, forget, like we've got race as one thing, but just like as a species, we seem to be destroying each other in various aspects, not just men and women, but races, and then just uh, different like prejudices against sexuality and stuff. Like it just shows what the hell is going on on this planet, basically. And um, yeah, a Martian would just go, mate, we could come and hit and take these guys on just without much of a because we're all again, we're all being forced against each other, and that's what's the most depressing thing about all of this. Um, and somebody, as somebody who comes from a very oppressed race, so um, I'm a I'm a Tamil, uh, and my parents were refugees from Sri Lanka, and um, it's not very widely publicised, but our protests in 2009 and this year as well were attacked by the police and it's just horrif horrifying that I don't understand the pe when we come up with these laws why is it that what's not taken into account is what is right but it's what do our prejudice prejudices determine what's right and yeah uh, I don't understand why those questions aren't the right ones that we ask when we make our laws and our constitutions and everything else that's part of the structural institution surrounding us. Thank you. It's much, isn't it? It is. I hear you. I really do. And thank you for sharing. The only thing I can say is each of us, each and every one of us, myself included, has to constantly ask myself, I have to ask myself questions. I know what's happening in my community. I know what's happening with my gender. How am I relating to other people? I don't want to be part of something or someone or an energy that down presses somebody else. So I constantly review. And that's the only th suggestion I can give to people. That when you uh, mention the oppressions you've faced and that so many different cultural groups or just b groups and backgrounds in general face oppression and everybody's kind of going through a similar thing. I don't know if that was the implied narrative. Um, I would then say, from an oppressed perspective, you have to then recognize that the oppressed can still continue to oppress others. There is a major hierarchy system within the world, um, within, I should probably say, within, <laughs> within institutional, institutional racism. And then I would always say accountability is a really big thing. It's one thing to acknowledge that things are happening to you, but it's another thing to acknowledge mm -hmm. what you may be doing to others. So I would say, look at what you're being learned, taught, sorry, is a really uncomfortable conversation to have with yourself. It's a really uncomfortable situation to be put in, but it's what needs to happen to create change. And sometimes it's about being that, breaking that generational curse and creating that change that kind of leaves traditions and practices in the past where they belong or just calling it out for what it is. And you may find that you have a lot more in common with other people than you do not in common with them. We've got time for a few more questions, if there are any more from the audience. Oh, yes, Judah. Uh, how being so exposed to all this violence and trauma, 
How do you keep yourself sane? Like, how do you compartmentalize things? I'm not sure that I am <laughs> sane. Um, it's a very good question. Thank you. It's called, um, what is it called again? Vicarious trauma. Vicarious trauma is when we keep hearing the same negative things or experiences over and over again. And um, So how we do this. We, we talk. We try to bring positive change. But we also, um, what is recommended is that we, we have counselling, we have supervision and all that kind of stuff. It's, again, it's a language that I don't subscribe to. I play music. A bus. Yeah. I would say that the Sister Space is a really unique organisation, yes. which I love working for because one of our main ethos is that we are not going to adhere to the white standard of norm if that makes sense. Um, we make it so the normal is what's normal to you. So in the office, we're all family. We listen to music, we bust joke, everybody's auntie, uncle. It's, we look after each other internally. It's yes. a very small organization. I think because of how the name is kind of catapulted in the last year, people think it's huge, it's very small. And we look out for each other. But we also um, have really rewarding weeks and really rewarding days. Um, it's not all bad. Obviously, this is horrible. I would argue that any group that's oppressed faces the same stuff we face, if anything. We just have a job in it. But um, I, I, mean, I, I mean, any group that's oppressed mm. or any people within the black community, I should say, um, understand what it feels to be like in our job role. It yeah. may not be domestic abuse, it may be police brutality. I actually find that social media is a lot worse than my job. Um, I'm still on it, but... I have to censor my Instagram, for example. Um, I would say we look out for each other and our success stories because it's not all bad. Uh, obviously, in an ideal world, the sister space wouldn't be needed. No domestic abuse charities would, but we do have success stories. We do have women that, in turn, come out and decide to work with us in helping other women. We do have things like this where we get to speak to young minds who are trying to create change as well. So there are good days. And we have a community a greater community who has backed us in ways you wouldn't believe. If you go on, is it Instagram or whatever, and our young people call it, yes? Twitter, whatever, bookface. We have the most amazing community from everywhere. Every race, every gender, every, 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 every. So that, that keeps us up as well. You know, if you come to Sister Space, you're likely to see yourself reflected as well. Because even though we support African and Caribbean heritage women and girls, our family is everybody. We want to live good with everybody. You see? So that's how we do it. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so, so much um, to all of our panelists, Shami, Belle, Ngozi, and Jen. Um, thank, thank you so much um, for all of you for coming out and all of you watching on the live stream. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the week. Just a spotlight on events coming up for the rest of the week at the Union. Before you do that, can we thank you? Can we thank you for inviting us down? Thank you for raising this. It's very important. Thank you guys for coming out. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our panelists. I am really, really grateful for the chance that the union is finally having these conversations. Tomorrow, we'll be hosting our panel on the long-term and psychological effects of COVID. On Thursday, we'll be hearing from former editor of the Financial Times, Lionel Barber, as well as having our penultimate Thursday night debate of term on the motion, this house prefers the screen to the page. Audition slots are open. So if you go on our Facebook page to audition for a student speaker, there will be four student speakers in this debate. Um, and on Saturday, we will be hearing from AJ Tracy. So keep your eyes peeled. And thank you so much again for coming to the event. We hope you enjoyed it and have a great rest of the week.